This program is about two kinds of interaction. The first between human beings and technology. We'll meet some people who look upon this medium of television not as primarily an instrument for recording events, but as an image-making tool that should be as responsive as paint and brush to the creative needs of an artist. When the video machines are too inaccessible, unresponsive, cumbersome, or expensive, they design their own or encourage their design by this country's new industrial subculture, independent young people who design electronic tools for use by artists outside the system. Colorizers, synthesizers, sometimes interfaced with computers, dazzling hardware that does everything but solve the artist's basic self-inflicted problem, what to say, what to communicate, no matter what the tools may be. We'll be talking to a young couple who treat the TV set itself with a solemn absurdity that helps us to see it in a new light and who make videotapes that tickle and prod our perceptions. There are three couples in this program and that's the other interaction I was talking about between people who not only share each other's lives but work closely together as artists, recharting the frontiers of art and technology. Louise and Bill Etra have been in the forefront of video activity since 1969. They have recently moved from New York to California. Louise also stars on camera in their tapes. And Hollywood itself has never revealed the heart's secrets so graphically. This machine um, is the Rutt-Etra video synthesizer, and we developed it with Steve Rutt, and the initial one was developed for the TV lab, and it controls the height of the image through zero. With the image through zero, it zooms images, uh, if you're careful with it, um, and you can uh, adjust the brightness as you zoom. It does the horizontal position of the image off the screen in uh, both directions. The vertical position of the image off the screen in both directions. Here I go. OK. To what end do you want to manipulate images in all these varieties of ways? Uh, I don't know. Uh, because they're there. Uh, uh, well, it makes it into putty, basically. And, I mean, you uh, know. You I, now can control the entire raster. I think it was Vasolka, uh, who I think you talked to in the same hour somewhere as soon as you figure out how it works together, uh, who said, uh, I mean, that distortion of image is, is as important as creation of image, or some such nonsense. And uh, so this gives me a way of uh, playing with the image. It actually sort of makes the image as if it was uh, stretched on a piece of uh, uh, rubber. And you can sort of make putty-type images like this, and then you can uh, do horrid things to them. Here we go. So we can go from that to that over time. And in some uh, amount of time, this image will unwind and uh, become that image. And, uh, and the more plugs I put in, the more interesting it probably becomes. And now somewhere on the screen that I can't see is another whole image. And that one moves independently of the first one and has all the same controls attached to it. So I can begin to do all sorts of uh, bizarre things and distort one and leave the other one running. And this struck us as being vaguely interesting. I mean, we used it in very simple ways in the tapes that you've got.
And the other thing that these sort of devices do is that they key. And here we are. Keyed. Keyed. Keyed etras with uh, Rodetra synthesizer nonsense in back. Now I have something else set up on the key. And if I uh, key through now, there I am colorized. That's the other thing that image processors do. They colorize. And this is the now from the Rodetra video synthesizer to the Electronic Associates of Berkeley uh, Video Lab, which is a, a keying type colorizer, which allows me to uh, put all these various colors in and uh, color my double chin, all sorts of uh, <laughs> Nice two flavors. Double chin with two types colors. <laughs> <laughs> we married uh, eight years next month, and uh, for eight years, or, or for seven of those eight years, one of us has worked, and uh, both of us have worked, and w one has put all their money into uh, support and creation of uh, equipment, um, and uh, that's how we've done it. You know, everybody comes in and says, looks and says, how did you get all this equipment? And the truth is you, that, uh, um, you know, two people, no children, uh, only a few cats that don't eat much, and uh, putting all their money into equipment will get you a lot of equipment. When we finished uh, building the Red Etra synthesizer, um, we started to get into uh, s playing with it, and the first thing we did was this piece, Narcissicon, and it involves something you can only do in television. Louise is in the studio with a camera looking at her, and her image is being processed in the uh, video switcher, and then going into the synthesizer. And I'm controlling the synthesizer. And we have this uh, division of Louise's face, and her, she's looking at the final image. Uh, so we have this loop where Louise can interact with the image as it's being created by me, and therefore, we have this human interactive loop uh, that's involved with, with making the image. And that's what you can't do in film. Uh, so here we have something that happens in real time. And it involves two people uh, talking to each other and making it at the same time and being both involved with the process. I planned very seriously to be a biophysics major when I went to college. It lasted one semester, and I was in the drama group uh, being strange. and was thrown out of my fraternity for being strange and in the drama group. And um, then I became a, uh, I quit college and took still photography courses and became a commercial still photographer and uh, met Louise when I was learning to be a still photographer. And she didn't throw you out for being strange? No, I met her, Louise. Uh, I, we had our first day today after she turned 17. It's a real young love story. And um, a year later, when she turned 18, yeah, we, got we were married. Um, and I went back to NYU to study film directing. I got into serious documentary work at NYU and studied film and television. And uh, George Stoney had just come down from the Canadian Film Board and brought porta packs with him in his wake. And we <laughs> sold our station spices. wagon, you know, and uh, we bought a porta pack. And I was working for George doing documentary stuff. And one day, I pointed the camera at the monitor. This is the time you do feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I pointed the camera at the monitor. And I started to do video feedback. And you get in these infinite loops. And uh, they start to revolve and make mandalas. There it goes. That's what it does. And um, I, guess we're still I got trapped in that. And I got interested in the electronics of video. In the meantime, I had been in uh, college at Hunter College and was programmed from birth to be a uh, high school art teacher and followed that through and did it for six months and couldn't stand it. And by that time, I was more involved with painting and graphics. And since we were spending all of our money on video equipment, I decided I'd better start taking advantage of it. And that's how I started. We've been married now eight, eight years. Um, and that makes us uh, married longer than most of our friends' marriages combined. And there are quite a few marriages in there somehow. And uh, 
probably because somewhere, maybe partially because of video, because you know, video is so hard to it's do. An expensive commitment. And it looks, and it looks, <laughs> it looks so easy, and it's so hard to do. And after a while, you saying the video keeps the home together? No, I was sort of saying that we had the idea that it wasn't going to be easy to be married, and so we worked at it continually, and we're still working at it. And I think if you go in saying, well, it's going to be fun, it's going to be perfect you don't have a chance. And no, we sort of went in saying it's going to be hard, we're going to have to put a lot of work in. And we've stuck to, with the video, and it's hard, and you have to put it's a lot of work like in. We've stuck with the marriage. It's If you start we have with video, this, uh, uh, marriage seems easy. We also have this long-term view. <laughs> yes. And we have the view that it's going to last forever. I think I'll be doing, doing visuals. I don't know if there'll be video or laser or some other weirdness uh, form, but I, but I think I'll be doing visuals all my life and I also think I'll be married all my life. You have these long-term views of things and everything gets sort of nice and interesting. And uh, you have a short-term view and it would be very hard to survive. The idea of a kinetic painting sort of being in the background of your house sort of appealed to us. So we did a series of 14 segments with music that we'd listen to at home and called it Video Wallpaper. It's called gold because the background is uh, from uh, the opening of uh, Wagner's opera. Uh As, as a painter and an art teacher, uh, let me ask you about the potential of video synthesizers as, a, as an instrument for fine art or high art or whatever. Can't we agree that there's been a lot of uh, just uh, mindless knob twirling, as someone once described it? Probably the biggest problem is that there are, at this point, just too many knobs to twirl. And unless you have an orchestra of people doing it, it's really hard to have any sort of control. Plus, there isn't any real visual language for what we're doing yet. So it makes it a lot more complex. One of the things Bill and I have been working on through grants from the NEA and the State Council has been just that, the idea of using the computer as a compositional tool for video artists, somehow trying to figure out how the computer can be used. Because I think both Bill and I strongly believe that that's probably the only way that if you can say that what we've been doing now are tunes, symphonies will be produced using video synthesis. Uh, there's no way of doing long segments of being able to, like when you're painting, to be able to do it, look back strip on it, it strip it down, <laughs> you know, slop some more color on, work it. There's no way of really molding it now. And that's basically due to the fact that it's at this point, just too complex. There's no way of sort of editing, controlling images uh, to a very fine degree. And I think that computers will probably give us the fine tuning that we're going to need. We got to this point, we were in the front of the loft, and you see all the knobs and dials. And we ran out of ability to do what we wanted to do with our equipment merely because we couldn't control all of it. And I started to look at for other means of controlling equipment, and uh, machines uh, are a way of getting a lot of dials into one dial, and a way of structuring movement of dials. And I got into computers because of that. Um, 
then I began to realize that since you could notate what you were doing on the computer, you began to get something closer to musical notation. You began to get something that could, if you, if you evolved a system that was simple enough, uh, become a notating uh, system for at least the distortion of real images and graphics. And with Stan Van Der Beek's help, I got down to uh, SciComm Electronic Music Center at South Florida about four and a half years ago. And we did this piece called PDP 11-10 Abstractions on a Bed Sheet, which is a black and white piece which involves only the 525 white lines that normally make up the TV picture. This used an audio program that was done at SciComm Music Center and the Red Etcher Synthesizer, and it used them together. And so shortly after I did this, four and a half years ago, I just buried myself in computers, started to buy my own, and I'm almost at the point at home where I can recreate a piece as simple as this. Um, this one was done uh, together with uh, Lou Katz, who uh, runs the Cancer Research Center at computer at uh, Columbia University and is now in the Department of Pharmacology uh, there. And uh, with Lou's help, and Lou's mostly, uh, among other things, my teacher in uh, matters dealing with computers. And we did this, and it's a short piece, and we call it Ms. Muffet. And it was done here, or really at my uh, last apartment. And it involves the Rodetra and the Tektronix computer terminal running on Lou's system and a little synth audio synthesizer and the uh, prototype for the video lab, uh, uh, video switching and synthesizing matrix. Basically, it was the first test to see if we could hook it all up and see if it would all work together. And it sort of all works together. And we did this little short piece. And I uh, just say that I consider humor important in video. If I look at what I've done, it's a mess of different styles, and uh, it's partially an exploration, and it's partially an exploration uh, which is linked to my desires and my uh, uh, efforts in building equipment. It all works. Basically, that's it for us, I guess. Whatever yeah. works, we use. And whatever works to show a very small part of a very personal uh, reality, and I don't know, if I have any thematic... Uh, ideas, it's that everybody is human, and that in that humanness uh, lies a lot of uh, things that we all laugh at or get frightened at or annoyed at altogether, and that that's uh, a unifying factor, and that sounds much too, uh, too uh, highfalutin to be worthwhile. But uh, I mean, that's what I think. You know, Narcissicon is what everybody does in the mirror in the mornings, <laughs> which is make love to themselves. And uh, I'm afraid of spiders. You haven't seen my mirror. <laughs> and, and Ms. Muffet is, you know, my fear of spiders and the nightmare where you wake up and you couldn't remember if you were the villain or the persecuted. And uh, the kiss is what everybody hopes happens <laughs> when a couple kisses. I mean, and fortunately it did. Lady of the Lake is uh, everybody's being trapped. Didn't you ever get trapped under the uh, sheets when you were a kid? and couldn't find the way out. I mean, it's all little moments that everybody sort of, rem everybody remembers these little moments. And at least if you can touch something that triggers something in everybody else, then you've, or in a lot of other people, then you've made the connection and well, then it works. Well, it's a point of reference. For me. That, that's always a good audience getter. And I, that, that's the job. I mean, part of the art is the audience for me. It can be one to one, and it can be one to a million or several million. I don't think and I'm quite ready for the several nice. million, but I, w I want eventually, yeah, I want everybody, you know. The whole thing, everybody and Ishtar too. Woody Vasulka is from Czechoslovakia. Stejna Vasulka is from Iceland. They came to the United States in the mid-1960s. In New York City, they founded an important center for video, music, and performance art called The Kitchen. They now make their home in Buffalo. I studied uh, hydraulic engineering, which I never had 
any use for because my mind was never mathematical, for example, mm -hmm. and it was a lot of calculation. So by family tradition, I became a kind of engineer, train, trade engineer. By my private interest, I, I did a lot of writing in poetry and, uh, and fiction. So I, I'm, in a way, a literary-oriented uh, mind. And, but I, uh, by, coincidence, by coincidence, I uh, went through film school in Prague, which I appreciate very much. So it gave me some practice in image. But it's, again, it was rather to the narrative and a kind of a symbolic content of image-oriented work that I've done. Even if I landed in documentarian kind of branch, I was still practicing a kind of poetry. That was my mm -hmm. general uh, background. I still th hope it is my general background. I was uh, uh, studying violin in Prague, and uh, I met him, and we came here together in uh, 65. And so we were here five years before we uh, sort of landed in the video. Like we, we started like Woody started in 69, somewhere in the summer. And um, uh, we started spending nights over at the place where he was working, which was called uh, Lloyd's Productions. They were doing an industrial show for television. I got in working in New York City in many multi-screen projections and uh, multi-screen film work for, for Montreal uh, uh, exhibits. So I, I guess if I was, in a way, predestined to try to do some of the media work, I would say, compared to the literary uh, uh, experience. But I could never practice in film. Uh, it, I could do it, but I could never find this kind of a mysterious challenge in it. Mm -hmm. about, and with video, it was an instant, uh, kind of an instant devotion, because the, the, the non-materiality of it and this mysteriosity of it was just overwhelming. Even, it was of course the simplicity to begin with, but then eventually it came to a whole uh, 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 kind of preoccupation. There's a piece called the Evolution, which is kind of a, a, a crucial to me personally. It was this, the first the time when I attempted to make a composition in three parts, kind of a triptych, again, slipping back into the narrative structures. And uh, that particular piece contains these most kind of important components to me, which was sound, image exchange, image sound, control, and the, the retiming, it means the horizontal drift. When we found out that, in fact, there was a frame in television, and the frame is just what you're looking at, which normally is hidden behind a television frame, so you don't see this kind of a frame. But by set of errors, we could move the original frame somehow in a position of the, uh, within the whole field, and we could somehow move this, this uh, uh, horizontal frame, as we say, horizontally. The equipment that we have used, which is small format, had a great, a great tolerance to our imperfections. Uh, it was kind of ideally suited for our work but of course, system cannot deal with this very easily. As you see, it breaks, uh, it breaks its structure. But it was just about what we could, what we could still perceive as coherent, you know, frame or structure. And in fact, through these deficiencies, we have learned a lot about the inside uh, of of the you know television uh, a medium. And in fact through the set of errors or, or coincidences, planted or accidental, uh, we eventually arrived to a much greater control than, than uh, systems which would be designed to, in fact, overall control only the aesthetic, so to speak, content, like the production equipment, which was designed totally to hide all those deficiencies and, in fact, never produced them. Mounting monitors, I mean, we got them cheap, so to speak, and a good size, 25 inch, such a Carson's. So if we established that kind of habit of showing on multi screen. It doesn't mean, for example, I never like multi channel in the sense of multi information matrix as other people uh, would do. It would rather relate uh, all the screens to a singular uh, movement or, you know, like horizontalities. It did a lot of work. 
but the sound image interchange is very important to us because in fact the, all the control modes I, what I mean the control modes is the, the change of the image in time is usually a, a kind of a relatively slow voltage change so it's a natural source for voltage control of sound so we've done a lot of sound image Kind of, uh, Which is reciprocal, sometimes the image controls the sound and sometimes right, the sound exactly. controls the so image. So we could generate images from sound wave waveforms and we could also influence sounds from the structure of brightnesses of, of, of electronic, I mean from television image. Is so there, excuse me, is there one particular work we could show that would dramatize that? Uh, well, noise field is one for sure. Woody did all the thinking on that, uh, I think. You set up the circle and, uh, and the noise and you set it up, set it in motion, and then you walked away because he just said, this is it, you know? Yes. And I sat down and I pressed the recording button and, uh, and started working with it, which is sort of typical what you do. If I set something up, Woody is pressed to come in and uh, sort of perform it. And I remember <laughs> very well in this case, you set it up, and I was very impressed, and you just walked away. television as material. As I build it together, I put it together physically or extend it or control it. And I understand what it is. Mm -hmm. But what it is, uh, I eventually believe television uh, is like what we are. We in fact create a myth of television, but there's no unity between the television and me yet. I'm trying to build some relationships. Because I have the possibilities now to, to use the medium to in a way communicate uh, to a you know, larger audience. The, we did not have that before. We were kind of confined into a, uh, our own environment. But with a small format, in a way, coming to terms with broadcast or the whole technological exchange, we are suddenly facing the possibilities of having this mode of work. The main key to, towards what happened, what appears to be a, a style, a direction, uh, is usually a, embedded in the tools. It's the, kind of, it's the evolution of the tools which in, in our work we usually illustrate. That means our work may not be illustration, but this definitely the kind of outward or the structural, uh, uh, how it looks like, is usually imprinted uh, or re a result of a particular tool. So we went through very simple tool to more sophisticated, complex video tools, colorizers, multi-layer keyers, and eventually we arrived at scan processors in, in that evolution, each of those components have definitely affected or imprinted the, the visual uh, uh, style.
series of works by Stena Vasolka called Machine Vision, designed to set the camera eye free from human encumbrance, is characteristic of the Vasolka style of cooperation. This is an installation that uh, I did of all vision. And uh, if, you, if you look at the, the thing here, it theoretically, each camera should take uh, 180 degrees, and together they should become 360 degrees. It's a uh, total surveillance. What I really wanted to do was to uh, take a, a ball like this and, and have the cameras pointed at the ball from the inside, because this, this thing here sees everything. It sees more than a human vision can ever accomplish. It can see the whole room at, uh, uh, at all times. And that's what uh, started to fascinate me about machine vision, as I call those things, that they can see things we cannot see, or um, the, the a camera can, uh, the machine vision comes out of uh, Woody's background, that, uh, uh, panning and, and type of things that he needed to construct those tools for that I'm now using. But I have, I'm also now uh, integrating into my work uh, my background, which is the violin. I, I use the, the violin, the uh, stroking with a bow on a string to uh, trigger the uh, electro electromagnetic spectrum uh, in the sense that uh, I would uh, use it to switch between two cameras and things like that. Yeah, if we should characterize ourselves as working team, you see, that would, that would be probably the key uh, understanding what we do, that we can exchange particular physical uh, uh, experiences, like uh, Stena was using a lot of the tools which I developed for different purposes. I learned from her, from, from her uh, let's say, uh, this untraditional look at an image and treatment in time, which is her very much musically developed discipline in tools, which I never really had. This is the level of interchange, because in work, you cannot truly share, you cannot work, you cannot create a unit of two. You can, in fact, make a creative decision only in a unit of one, which we were both are witness to. So that sometimes you, were, you each become the assistant of the other it's at different exactly times. exactly what it is. Yeah. Sometimes we wouldn't even know it. Sometimes it was so fluid that one of us would take over, and since we trust each other, we have no problem in, in just uh, giving up the ego to the other. We sometimes think we have the kind of a directional style, but we have violated that so many times. Like one time, I wanted to be a purist and to use only generated image. I would not touch the camera image. Other times, I just don't mind uh, kind of violating those, those rules. And I found that in, in Stenland's work even much more pronounced. It's so, you know, contra, contradictory in a way. Because sometimes it's totally like, as, as you said, light or surface oriented. In the other case, it's totally physical. And in my case, I have this total schism now. Uh, in one sense, I deal with arithmetic image. In the case, I deal with scan processed image. One so physical or so analog, the other, other one so digital or so abstract in a mathematical sense. Woody Vasolka has said he wants to be a person who takes the fire from the gods and brings it down to the common level. He describes his learning approach to the computer as that of a blue collar worker, working with engineers, confronting directly the physical structure instead of relying exclusively on cerebral manipulation. The Vasilkas are mediators between the powerful image-making capacity of technology and the rest of us, seeking to transform computer science into an art-utilized, people-utilized material. At this stage, the process involves both study and play. So we were, we are, we were getting arithmetic functions all the time. I see. So you have to sort of like turn them off by, by turning on this bit. A minus B minus 1. Isn't that wonderful? Great. Great. The X is we want 4, 1, and what did you want again? Uh, put just like 3 into all 3 of them. 
Yeah. You want gray? You sure? Yeah. This yeah. color is fantastic. How about this? Rest. That's nice. It's not bad Look at me. Oh, that's a nice picture. That makes you more pretty than ever. Oh, wow. The blue green eyes. Wow. She's like a queen. Yeah. Da, oh, I da. don't believe this. This is my wife. I don't believe this shit. <laughs> X1, X2. There are some wise. Oh, oh, you know what it is? The bits aren't all there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, oh, this is very intriguing. Oh, the, I think I need his hand. Ah! Wow. I tell you, because it's pinned probably the way that it, you're missing some. Uh huh, maybe it's pinned wrong. Zoom zero, zoom one one. Why didn't you do that right away? Okay, s stop it. Any, any, anywhere. Me? Yeah, zoom it. Oh, I know what we should do. We should switch the color mapping. So we should switch the no numeric register to A. A is 15, mode 0, 1, 7, 2, 7. Hey, hold it, hold it, this is fantastic. If you decide that there is a better way to spend your weekend than in front of a TV set, then head for the peace and tranquility of unchanneled nature. You may be in for a surprise. It's there already. The people responsible for this benign infiltration of technology into nature, into art, are Kit Fitzgerald and John Sanborn. Why don't we try as carefully as we can to chart the, the path by which you found yourself into this field? I mean, you, you, did it begin with, with uh, sitting around watching Saturday morning cartoons, or can you trace it for us? From the from the vantage point of being television children, you mean? Yeah, that sort of thing. Or do you or do you do you accept being considered a television, a child of television or the television generation? Or do you accept well, any of this? I never was, uh, because I wasn't allowed to <laughs> to watch TV. As a matter of fact, so that's the kind of interesting thing. Uh, uh huh. So instead of watching TV, they sent me out to um, painting lessons and the like. And that's, Did they explain that's why you weren't allowed to watch TV? It wasn't worth the time. Oh, it's, and it still isn't. <laughs> <laughs> My father saw that. Uh, and uh, so I began uh, painting when I was very young and then it just led across other mediums through uh, drawing and printmaking, uh, photography, and then into video. When I was very young, I wanted to be a science, a scientist. Were you a whiz at science fairs at school? I won, I won two gold medals in science fair, but we won't even talk about no, that. No, let's talk about it. What did, you, what did you do? This weird thing is that <laughs> when I was younger, I took uh, iron filings and put them in polyester resin, put magnets under the iron filings so that they 
the fields of force would be frozen. And about, uh, I guess about six years after, no, no, less than that, about four years after that, I may start making sculptures out of polyester resin. I think when we were talking before about being television children, I think of watching television on Saturday mornings. I mean, it's the first thing I think of when you think of television children, watching the cartoons on Saturday mornings. And they did awful things, but always in a box, right? Mm -hmm. The most spectacular things in the world, guys running off of cliffs and their legs keep moving and they turn around and they run back in midair or back onto the cliff, right? And they all did it right in front of you in this little box. And we concentrate to a great extent on that on that box and like you said the limitations or the the expectations of the medium that you can only go so far using the equipment available it's not like being it's not like real life because you're shooting through a lens it's not like film because anything you do immediately changes the situation there are certain electronic things that happen yeah i think that'll that'll pretty much continue because of the fascination starting with that box the fascination beginning with not only the containment within a certain certain fixture like if you if you go to the movies it's this huge it's an ocean it's something that you move with mm -hmm. there's no such thing to me as being bored in the movies because it always picks me up and drags me with it the movement is much more important than what is happening in the movement because it's so big and it's so in engaging and uh, television's not like that it's in a box you're removed and you've got to look at it you're not looking with it or you're not looking up at a huge kind of larger than life, you're looking at something smaller than life. And I think so. I think our study is at that box, at that certain precision that it demands. The boundaries being very, very carefully drawn. First of all, we've set up a, something yeah. that is very incongruous, a monitor, for example, placed in a street. Mm -hmm. and, but then we're also uh, moving with it in a very strange way. I mean, that one is of the, slightly humorous. One of the great things about video was that it said that television didn't have to stay in the living room. That uh, television was something more than just the box. It was more than just something being broadcast into your home. Television meant uh, almost something metaphysical, almost something non-real, something very ephemeral. And we try to take that to its logical absurd extreme by placing the television in different areas, by having the television actually part of the environment. It goes along with our putting the recorded images of the natural environment in the natural environment that it's the worst blend of technology and nature you could possibly think of, <laughs> right? But at the same time, it's the ultimate absurd extension. We're pushing the natural and the unnatural together, whether they like to sit next to each other or not. We're trying to make a half-waking, half-sleeping world where you can't quite differentiate between the two, where the two worlds sort of coincide. You're existing both in a black and white world, which is the ultimate video world, and you're also existing in a color, three-dimensional, touch and feel environment. And we want to belie the fact that you can't reach into the box, you can't delve into the cathode ray tube and extract something, but at the same time, we want to present the fact that you can, you can. Also in Exchange in Three Parts, we're dealing with the difference between what is live and what is taped. Mm -hmm. For example, with actions happening on the screen within a certain time and actions happening outside of the television yeah. in a different time, happening live, recorded in color.
the uh, tapes where you include the the television image into human activity by passing an apple through the screen uh, and other such devices. That seems like a, a limitless in its possibilities. Do you feel you've explored that enough, or do you, you pretend to go on doing more? And oh, we'll do more probably. But to us, that's well, it's many things. There's always the talk of the all-pervasive electronic environment that television is invading our private thoughts and this is our kind of humorous exponent of that that it's wherever you look and also it's the other world that we try to describe that you can pass into the other world you can pass beyond the black hole into a world where matter is turned upside down where it's not only contained in the box but it's black and white two-dimensional mm -hmm. it's kind of frightening to us mm -hmm. you can move in and out of that as freely as you as you please yes. There's a certain correspondence between the two of us. There's a certain level of collaboration that can't be understood by other people. There's a certain filling of gaps in trains of thoughts. Would you pass the, and it's already being passed. Would you move the camera a little bit to the, and it's being moved. We think similarly in terms of framing, in terms of imagery. We may not want to say, well, we may want to say the same thing, but we may not want to say it the exact same way. So. While Kid is scribbling little things on a piece of paper and I'm off closing my eyes and dreaming about something, we arrive at the same image but from different, from different perspectives, from different tangents. It's similar concerns. It's wanting to express a certain idea and then just finding the ways to express it after that. And while John's sense of humor in work is stronger than my own, I think in our coming to work together, while my He's brought the, more of a sense of humor. I've brought more of a kind of classical bent to it. Right, right. Say, video makers, having a tough time of it? Well, how do you think famous video makers get their tapes done? Certainly not by slaving away a day in a studio with cameras. No, thanks to a breakthrough in technology, there's spray on video. The new and efficient way to make video without the old fuss and muss. And easy? Well, you bet. Just shake up the can, hold six to eight inches away from the object you want to cover, and spray on video. Now, wasn't that simple? And wipes clean with a damp cloth, too. But remember, you can't buy this in any store because it doesn't exist. It's really just a process and available only through viewing this commercial. We make abstract videotapes using realistic images. We try and make 
things that are non-narrative, that are telling a story in abstract or metaphorical terms, using real images instead of using completely abstract images so that we're building a story which doesn't necessarily have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but has either a visual or a video sort of moral to it, but using realistic images. What we have to offer combined with what there is available yeah. is what we want to present. Whether it's in our monitor works or exchange in three parts, which is the available technology combined with our ideas of what that technology should or shouldn't be and how it pervades our life, or whether it's our invasion into a, an already existing culture and bringing our notions of what that culture should or shouldn't mm -hmm. be upon a, a viewing public. It's really sassy. <laughs> 